It's nice to follow through. Hi, Randy. Can I ask you a question? I'm on, I'm on the, I'm, I'll take that, I'll be quick. I, I'm on the Christian Jewish dialogue and and uh, Catholic Jewish dialogue. And we, we do, um, uh, you know, a lot of joint programs and trying to expand the program. And I understand that when the Torah was translated from the Greek to the Latin, one of the uh, translations was a mistranslation from the word light to the word horns that resulted in the Christian view that Jews had horns. Is that, is that an accurate or is that a Bubba Misa? Uh, well, it's accurate to a sense. So um, uh, Karnaim and Karen um, is the same root. Um, and so one is light and one is horns. So uh -huh. it's a mistranslation. It's just, well, I guess it could have been a mistranslation, but um, it, the, the verse is that the light was shining on Moses's forehead, right? Sure, sure, um, sure. And so, um, uh, you know, when it was depicted artistically, it, you know, the, the shining lights ended up right. looking like horns, right? Um, and then when you have the same root, it's, uh, it uh, causes a, um, an interesting uh, result. <laughs> right. so, the, but so, so the, but the translation was not from, so it might have been mistranslated from the Hebrew to the Greek as well. It could have been. Could have been. We, yeah. we know. Right. Okay. I mean, it's the same root. So, yes, it could have yeah, been. Absolutely. Yeah. It could have been. Yeah. Or from the Latin to the, I mean, Greek to the Latin. Okay. okay. Right. But, uh, I didn't know whether that was a Bubba Misa. I've read it and heard about it many times, but I. Yes. No and that and that obviously then led um, because of the the depiction of Moses with yeah. horns, even though it's not intended to be horns um, led to, uh, to the anti-Semitic belief that Jews have horns. Sure, I mean I've, I've been asked that in my yeah. life, not not recently. Yeah. Not recently but my uh, my mother when she was in college had a um, non-Jewish boyfriend, and he uh, early on when they were dating, he reached over and was patting her head. She said, yeah. what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just looking for the horns. I've never met a Jew before. And oh. uh, yeah, she was shocked. She And she didn't know. She had never heard of that uh, belief and right. was totally yeah. taken aback. Oh, I knew that's from one that was a I've child. Many times. Are you horny? <laughs> <laughs> Bad joke. It's Shabbat. Good morning, oh, Rabbi good. Perman. Good morning, hey. Rabbi Voxman. Hey. How are you? The mitzvah. Hey. Good morning, Rabbi Furman. Uh, uh, oh, it says Jane Furman. Okay, let me fix that. Just you want me to fix it for you? You know how to do it? In case Randy, anybody thinks it's, you know. Randy Parr, it's so good to see you. Yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> Are you back in Naples? I am. I got here Sunday. I oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I've been connected with my son and daughter-in-law last night. They came here and they brought a big bag of Thai food. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good having you back here. You Thank you. Nice. How do you get the uh, name change? I'll do it for you, Rabbi. I got it for you. I did it. Oh, like magic. <laughs> okay. What a wonderful morning this is going to be. Three learned rabbis to teach us. Thank you so much. Super. <laughs> Good morning, all. The more, the better. That's what our dark tradition says. So, um, so how are we doing here? We have, we have a few people. We got a minion. Yeah, um, we yeah. definitely have a minion. Um, let's give it just—I would say—two more minutes. Yeah, sure. Okay. There's a few of our regulars that are missing, so let's just see if they uh, end up joining us. And I will. To our interested, I've already started recording, so this session is recorded. If uh, if you want to rewatch it, or if somebody missed it, you want to pass it. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you, because um, I always get a, a bunch of, why didn't you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had so, a, uh, a, a fun story to add some cheer to people's lives, especially mine. Um, the Kansas City have, has high schools like cities do, and they have this quarterback from one of the high schools who is really, really good. And uh, he chose to go to Wisconsin, which is my alumnus. And um, he uh, he was redshirted, didn't play for the first year, and he started yesterday because the Big Ten started. 
They played Illinois, who they lost to last year, and he actually tied school records for uh, most consecutive passes completed and touchdowns thrown. Wow. So uh, for those who went to Wisconsin, it's uh, a very heartwarming story because they kept touting him and how good he is. And they didn't start him because they wanted to wait a year for the other quarterback and the other quarterback got hurt. So he started yesterday and uh, it was uh, for the, for those who know him, because his name was spread around a lot here, a guy named Mertz, M-E-R-T-Z. Uh, it was really interesting. So it's a, a, a good news story with all the bad news we hear. That's great. Did they That's play great. Yesterday on Friday. I'm sorry. When did they play? Uh, they played. They played last night. Yeah, I don't think they had any uh, Orthodox shoes in the team. Okay. But the big, the Big Ten started play this weekend, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so they played last night. And they're playing today, like Michigan's playing, Ohio State's playing. Penn State. They were going to cancel the season, and then they elected to play. A partial season, uh, empty stadium. A question: Who won? Uh, Wisconsin won handedly. I would say it was like around forty-two to seven. And Illinois is a good team. Uh, I don't know but, if you. But Wisconsin is better. Well, for this game, they were. So you know football, right? Um, but uh, the, the Illinois coach is also an interesting story. It's a guy named Lovey Smith who coached the Bears, I believe, and he had some ups and downs, and then he went to college football, and he was having um, a decent career. Uh, so he's always an interesting story that goes with it. He's a very uh, a, a, a character, like a cartoon character guy that you see on the sidelines called Lovey Smith. Okay. Yeah, Sounds so good. Man, it, it's fun. Wonderful. <laughs> Why don't we get started? If anyone else joins, we'll let them in. Um, let's, uh, okay, let's get prayer started. For study. Uh, Should we do the prayer for study and then I'll turn it over? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm ready. All right. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kishanu Mishvotah V'tzivanu V'tzot 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 Over to you, Rabbi Perman. Thank you. I also have to add that today's kippah is uh, in happy remembrance of the bar mitzvah of Sam Kelly, August 24th, 2019. Right. So just so you know. Very That's nice. Great. I'll let Alicia know. If you'd like me to read yours, let, 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 you know, if you want to read yours out, it's okay. Um, so how's, how's everybody doing? Yeah, everybody good? Everybody. Doing good. Okay, That's thank you for being here. Um, the standard answer now that I've been hearing a lot <clears throat> is how you doing and that's the question and the answer is pandemic fine <laughs> because yeah. it modifies everything All so right. you know as pandemic goes it's fine uh this morning it's noah it's a story that um everybody knows but i'm going to show you ways that nobody knows it and uh, I have three goals this morning. One is to rescue this material uh, from the uh, world of children's literature to a more sophisticated level, even though it fits very well with little children. Um, I wanna make a few discoveries with you that uh, aren't usually seen. And finally, um, as we always try when we teach, uh, we want to let it speak to us in our lives and our world uh, in ways that we find useful. And you're going to find all that in, uh, in Noah. So we're going to begin with um, a flood. And I think we have a text for that. Do we have a flood text? <coughs> Uh, but, but nope, that's the end. Go back. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you for putting my cues in there. I'm happy about that. Uh, <clears throat> somebody want to uh, be our first reader? 
the, uh, the, Lord, here. The, the Lord saw how great Doc the volunteered. Thank you. <laughs> There's going to be a floody floody. Yeah. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. And every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created and with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. Yep. So it's, it's only been a week that the world has been created. Uh, last week we began the new Torah cycle and uh, started with Genesis. And look at what happened in, in the course of seven days. Uh, started with an empty void and ends with the creation of human beings. And the human beings are, um, are assigned to live in a kind of paradise called the Garden of Eden. But um, human beings being what they are, it doesn't take God very long to start regretting uh, what he had made. Uh, suddenly we're confronted of, with a picture of a world gone awry. Um, and a world that turned to violence to settle all their differences. And it taps into something. There is um, there's something perverse about human beings. Somebody, what happened? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. There's something perverse about human beings. The um, the nasty truth is that on one level, on our basis level, we want to be bullies. And we want everybody to do what we want them to do. And we want to grab power and use it to crush people. Uh, someone said it starts with a tiny infant, a tiny little hand grasping mommy's finger. <laughs> I want power. I want to control this. And uh, the stronger ones want to bully the weaker ones. And the weaker ones wish they were stronger so that they too could be built bullies. Why can't we all be bullies? And that's what happened. The world fell into very bad ways. So let's go on, slide two. But, continue Chuck, we're fine. Uh, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. Okay, well, um, civilization has unraveled. <clears throat> and um, here's this fellow named Noah. Just who is he? Well, here's what the Torah says about him. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless among all the people of his time. Of his time is a translation of Bedoro Tav in his generation. And that's the catch because the old rabbis were very sensitive to any nuances of meaning. Uh, and they were curious about that term in his time, in his generation. It seemed redundant. Why not just say he was a righteous man? Leave it at that. Why those qualifying words? What's that about? So does it make it better or does it make them worse? <clears throat> well, it depends. It's, they took sides. There are two ways of looking at it. One's, you know, it's typical rabbinic on the one hand, on the other hand. So on the one hand, the one hand first, um, This is not high praise. 
the Hebrew word bedorotav in his generation, in his time, says, yes, he was better than the others. But if you compare him to Abraham, to Moses, uh, you see he doesn't measure up. In other words, Noah, I knew Abraham and you're no Abraham. Why not? Because Abraham would not have just gone along with this. Abraham would have argued with God like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. So let's look at the other side. The other side doesn't see the picture that way. It doesn't see it as he doesn't measure up. Instead, what they see is everybody around him was awful. He rose above the fray. In any other time, he would have been outstanding because this was a fellow who didn't take his cues from the surrounding world. He was the one who was better. Um, just take, let's see, take a, uh, a quick look. How, how many of you think that the first interpretation is better? That he, he, he was mediocre even though he stood out in his time? I don't really how many of you think he was exceptional? Just raise your hand. Okay, but, well. well, well, well yeah. he, he was exceptional in the sense that uh, he. Um, did everything that God asked him to do. He yeah. didn't deviate for, from God's will. And everybody else did nothing God asked them to do. That's, that's a good point. But like, Rabbi Perman, it says he walked faithfully with God. That, yeah. that doesn't what express does any reservation. It uh -huh. didn't say he walked faithfully with God most of the time or compared to others. That's a very straightforward uh, phrase. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But I think there's a lot to be said for the other side. Um, and here's why. Here, I look back on uh, my uh, congregational career and um, let's see, I spent half of it in New York and half of it in Naples. And Looking back, I can easily say it's a lot easier to be Jewish in New York than it is to be Jewish in Naples. Mm -hmm. Because in New York, it's the food you eat. And think about the Levy's rye, rye bread ad. Um, it's the air you breathe. It's all Jewish. Being Jewish is normal. Not being Jewish is not normal. Even the non-Jews are a little bit Jewish, right? So Jewish identity isn't a problem. And I remember when I was a rabbi in Mount Vernon, I went to a Board of Jewish Education meeting and they were talking about cultivating Jewish identity. How do you cultivate Jewish identity? And they turned to me and they said, what do you do in your congregation to cultivate Jewish identity? I said, absolutely nothing. Uh, and they said, what do you mean? I said, well, a kid growing up in Mount Vernon knows that he's not Italian, he's not Black, uh, he's not Catholic, he's got to be Jewish. <laughs> because those are the choices. It's normal and it's easy. But when I moved to Naples, I started hearing really remarkable stories. Um, I remember a man explained to me that he grew up in a small town in rural Minnesota, that his parents were determined to give him a bar mitzvah. There was no synagogue. So they drove him to Sunday school at the nearest reform temple, an hour and a half each way every single week. And he might have been interested, he might have been bored, but one thing he got for sure, and that was that he realized how important this was to his parents. And certainly you can triple that when it comes to grandparents. He couldn't possibly have missed that. 
And that's a story I've heard many times. In fact, it's even happened down here uh, with children who, uh, who lived in Immokalee, children who lived in Everglades. Um, they, were, they were sent here, they were brought here. That's a commute, even Marco Island's an hour commute some days. So uh, they, they did something exceptional. And that's what Noah did right. He was a good person in a bad place, in a bad culture. And it took constant effort for him. And maybe that's why he was picked. Uh, the old rabbis said, whoever performs even a single mitzvah, his days shall be prolonged and he shall inherit the land. Well, he certainly did do that. And the lesson is you should try hard and your efforts will be noticed. So, so how does this imply that Noah was a model, a model citizen, perfect human being? He wasn't. Uh, we've seen Abraham. We've seen Abraham standing up to God. Abraham said to him, aren't you a God of justice? Shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? You know, how can you destroy innocent lives along with the guilty? He hears God's warning to save himself, and he goes about doing it, and nothing else mattered. Okay, slide three. All right, somebody else, uh, Lydia, do you want to read? So make yourself an ark of separate wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with speech inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits, uh, cubit long, 50 cubit wide, and 30, 30 cubit high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to uh, bring flood waters on earth and to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has a breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you. Um, as you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two uh, of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it uh, away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Okay. Now the last line interests me, he did everything as God commanded him. But what I wonder about is his attitude because there's two ways to go about building the ark. One, he could say to himself, you know, this is really, really important stuff that I'm doing. This is the most important thing I've ever done. The whole world is about to go. And it's up to me alone to bridge the old world and the new world. And it could all collapse and anything could happen if I mess up. And what an overwhelming responsibility that is. And anyone with a shred of leadership in their DNA would have been thinking that way. Or was he just an ordinary guy who said, God told me to build this big thing. And I have to pull all these logs together and all this wood together and all this smelly pitch and I have to put this together with, with I don't have enough help. And, but the thing is, I got to do it because you don't argue with God, right? Because when he gets mad, you don't want to know. So I better do this. So here's another possibility suggested by a rabbi in medieval Spain. We bring everybody into our conversation. Suppose 
God didn't say, make yourself an ark. Suppose, watch this, God said, make yourself an ark. Make yourself into an ark. You become the vehicle. You are the one who will carry the world forward from one point to the next. And then there follows a long discussion <coughs> on how do you make yourself an ark? But close your eyes for a second and imagine that you make yourself an ark. You are the vehicle to save others. You are the vehicle for continuity. You are the vehicle for culture, for change, for obedience to God, and for a happy life. So there's a lot of midrashim on this. Make yourself Rabbi, a Rabbi question. Yeah. Make yourself an ark. You can look at it in several ways. Noah is the builder. And therefore, he's got to construct the ark. Or well, Noah is the ark manager in which he gets the helpers to build the ark, where he is the uh, leader of the uh, the crew to build the ark. So make yourself an ark can be either he has to do it personally, or he gets help to do it, and he gets people to help build the ark. Yeah. And then there's this third this third attitude of make yourself into an ark. Put yourself in the place of the mission itself. And, yes, but where do you fit all his sons and all the flocks and all the animals into him then? Right. Well, that's, you know, that's a big question and, and it's not one that's answered. You know, why do all those animals have to go down too? Uh, there's, there's, there's no question about it. But he manages it and uh, he builds oh. the ark. Rabbi, one, one other yeah. point. Sure. Since God made the animals to begin with, but he gave the animals the ability to reproduce. He didn't want to recreate the animals. He wanted re reproduction to rebuild a society, to rebuild the world. It's different than him waving magic wand or having the animals do what they're supposed to do, man and the animals, to repopulate the earth. Good point, David. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So here's a story also centering around all this. When the animals were getting onto the ark, when the people were getting onto the ark, <clears throat> it's a story about, it's an allegory. Two people got on, wanted to get on the ark. One was named Emet, truth, and the other was named Sheker, falsehood, lying. And legend explains that falsehood wanted to come in, but he couldn't because he didn't have a mate. So he started looking around and he spotted truth, Emet on his way into the ark. And he ran up to him and he said, truth, let's partner, let's get together. <clears throat> we are a good pair since you are only known because of me. When people experience a lie, they start looking for the truth. And truth thought about it and he agreed, of course. However, as they got closer to the ark, Sheker, falsehood, felt nervous. He was afraid that Noah would not admit him, that he would recognize him as the father of lies. And so he asked truth to lend him his cloak so he could disguise himself. And he put on Truth's cloak. He said to Truth, please lend me your cloak because you don't need a cloak. Everybody recognizes you, but they don't always recognize me. So Truth reluctantly agreed and gave him the cloak. 
and they both went onto the ark. However, once the flood receded, falsehood jumped ship. He snuck out of the ark and he never returned truth's cloak. And ever since that time, we are told, falsehood, Sheker, has been wearing the garment of Emet, truth. Mm -hmm. This is why it's so hard to tell the difference between truth and falsehood. Now you know. Next, slide four. The origins of fake news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, any other comments? That's true. I, I told you it speaks to us too. By the way, I, I have a, a book to recommend if um, any of you are interested. Uh, it's a book by a young man named David Scheimer, who uh, is a graduate student at Cambridge. He's also a Marshall Scholar there. He's an American. And um, he writes about foreign interference in our elections. But he starts after World War II and continues all the way through. The name of the book is Rigged, R-I-G-G-E-D. Uh, I got it on Amazon, and um, I, I couldn't put it down. It was really, really compelling, uh, especially when it got through uh, to um, uh, the 2016 elections and what the Russians were doing. Um, it's a scary thing. And what their, their chief weapon was Sheker, fake news. Yeah. Okay, next. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the water increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth and covered all the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. The people and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him on the ark. And the, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. Right, so after the rain came flood, <coughs> flood surge as they talk about on the news and uh, lasted 150 days. So I'm gonna introduce another Midrash, except this one comes from um, Kabbalistic literature. According to this, um, when Noah came out of the ark, he opened his eyes and he saw the whole world completely destroyed. And he started to weep and he said, God of the universe, if you destroy your world because of human beings who are sinners, then why did you make them to begin with? You knew what they were going to do. It should be one or the other. If you create people, don't destroy the world. If you're going to destroy the world, don't create people. And the Holy One answered him, O oh, foolish Noah, now you talk about saving others. But when I first spoke to you and said, make yourself an ark, I took my time. I explained everything. I gave you all those detailed instructions. I spoke to you at great length just hoping you would show some compassion, hoping you would ask for mercy for the world. But as soon as you heard that you would be safe in the ark, the evil of the world no longer mattered to you. 
You built that ark and you saved it yourself. Now the world has been destroyed and now you speak about the others? So Noah's world was destroyed for reasons he couldn't fully comprehend. He didn't have the capacity to care about anyone else. And we need to be better than Noah. The lesson is we are indeed responsible for each other. Rabbi, in modern day, people built bob shelters that could be likened to the ark. They stocked it with food and clothing and water to last them because they were told in their head that the earth would be destroyed. And their neighbors said, you're crazy. What are you doing? I have a feeling that Noah was faced with the same admonition by those around him. This crazy old man is building this boat. Ha, ha, ha. He's nuts. Mm -hmm. So is it Noah's fault that others didn't join him? He probably tried to get others to build this boat but no one did. Well, that's, that's a missing tidbit of information that uh, allows us to let our imaginations fly. And that's a good thing. Uh, you know, there, there are, I understand this in this country, especially uh, in the heartland, there's, uh, there's a whole survivalist movement. And, um, you know, I, I just envision what would happen if there was a real crisis? Somebody stock, as Paul said, somebody stockpiles uh, food and supplies. Somebody needs food and supplies. They're at the door, and uh, the stockpiler is going to what? Get his shotgun and fend them off. That's part of the, what they stockpile. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and and also. The uh, I was reading this cycle about at one point there was a, a big uptick in uh, the price of gold. Everybody was jumping into gold, uh, trying to preserve their assets. And I had this really silly vision of um, somebody walking into Publix with a Krugerrand and saying, I'd like a, a quart of milk, please. <laughs> How does he get changed? <laughs> Rabbi, it's not that far when we had uh, the onset of COVID. If you remember, there was hoarding of things like toilet paper where people couldn't get them and they were off the shelves. Yeah. So, right. So it doesn't go that far. But I, I did have a question on, on this particular passage we're reading and others, at least one in the Torah. What is the interpretation of the animals, the birds, the animals? What did they have to do with it? I know. I have the same problem. Uh, I do too. It's, it's just not dealt with, that's all. Um, animals are property. Uh, I think uh, the Torah talks about uh, how you treat animals, kindness to animals, but I think it didn't apply to this story, so they just let, left it alone. And, uh, Rabbi Boxman, you got any ideas? Why is there no compassion for the animals who are all going to get killed out there? They didn't I think you're anything. right. It was at this time, it was viewed as property. There wasn't, uh, I haven't read any commentary specifically on that. There is other places in, in our text that talk about compassion to animals. In fact, we're instructed to feed our animals before ourselves. Our animals are supposed to be given a Shabbat in the same way that, that we as humans take Shabbat. So there is absolutely discussion about compassion of animals, but... Um, not much is said about it in this case. Yeah, maybe you'll find it in the, the new Sasha Baron Cohen movie. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi, I have a question. He, 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 he takes his daughter and <laughs> makes her a gift to, to the United States of A. Yeah. Rabbi, I have a question. Could you place Noah chronologically? Was he before Abraham 
Pope Moses, yeah. and of course the Torah. Yeah, he was foundational. He was before everything. He was in the same league as creation. Well, how could you compare Noah to Abraham and Moses when they didn't exist at that time? And how could you ask the, the people to obey the laws when they didn't have the Torah? The, the thing is that the book was written, the Torah was written by Moses. So if you consider the author, maybe it would make a think about it in that respect. Yeah, but we didn't, these people did not have the guidance that we are blessed with. They didn't have the blueprint. They didn't have the heroes of Abraham and Noah. And no, I'm sorry, Abraham and Moses. Well, so, Rabbi, Moses wrote it. Rabbi, mm -hmm. they were created in the image of God. What does this? What does that say about God in terms of how do people behave? You have both good people and bad people. Yeah, exactly. They all, we're all, we're all people of God. Right, but here there was a preponderance of bad people, and um, the uh, historical perspective is something that human beings have only had for a very short time. Um, you know, we uh, people didn't think like that before. Though. In fact, they, they even said in the Talmud, they set down a principle that uh, there's no there's no precedence or the, nothing precedes or follows in the Torah. In muktam uchar. And but the, certain legends uh, are there to explain how the world works. And this is one of them. And this one is just as the Genesis story, the early Genesis stories, we start to explain, uh, you know, how the, how the earth was formed and how the heavens were formed, and and people and uh, and, and animals and and women out of men. And, uh, it's it's this is the reason for the order of things, and. Uh, Every ancient people had legends like this. Uh, the, the Bible has decided Babylonian flavor to it because that's where culturally everything came from. Uh, just the way uh, I would use English literature to, to, to teach Judaism, they would teach use Babylonian literature to teach Judaism. Makes perfect sense there. Um, <clears throat> but we can't really apply our 21st century critical eye to, uh, you know, to the situation. That's exactly. Rabbi, I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. Isn't, isn't there some kind of parallel or a similarity between the creation of a world by God and then you decided, okay, I'm going to perfect it, destroy this one and recreate it? So isn't there a similarity of creation and the desire of when Noah got out of, uh, of the ark where there was nothing? So God recreated again another world. Right. I'll, I'll show you something that answers that. Uh, just hold the question and suspend it for a little bit and, and we'll get to it. Okay. It's a good question. It's an important question. Okay, so this one. Uh, I assigned the title Après moi le déluge, uh, which um, were words that were spoken by, uh, well, they're not sure who spoke them, uh, Louis XV, when he saw that uh, down the line there was going to be a French Revolution. And, uh, uh, or it was Madame Pomp Pompadour, who was his mistress, and she said, Après nous le déluge. Uh, after us, you know, do, do whatever you want. She was, she and the king were being criticized by uh, by the uh, lawmakers as being too profligate and too, and being spendthrift and living this uh, super luxurious life. And she says, "Après moi le déluge." It was like, "Let them eat cake," was, or you know, "I don't care." Do you? Okay, so let's go on. Next, next. The Ark has landed. Uh, Dr. Osowski, you're doing pretty well. Keep going. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the Ark. 
and he sent the wind over the earth, and the waters did recede. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the head of it had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Arat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month. And on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountain became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark, and he sent down a raven, and it kept flying back and forth until the waters had dried up from the earth. Okay, we'll get back to the raven. Uh, quote the raven nevermore. Uh, and got full. Yeah, right, very good. <clears throat> so, what a novel that would be. The ark has landed. I could just right. mention David Balducci's next book. Beautiful. Ark has landed, yeah. Yeah. And what about this raven? I thought it was a dove that had supposed to have gone out. Aha, uh -huh, it is. <laughs> You'll see in a second. Um, you're way ahead of me this morning. So, um, the ark has landed. But God remembered, and now it's time to get off, right? And what happens when they get off? Well, they stay on. And uh, eventually, God gives the order, and um, it's time to get off, and in an orderly fashion. And Noah doesn't jump and run. Uh, he wants, you know, if any of you have been on a cruise, uh, he wants an orderly disembarkation, and why not? So that's the right way to do things. So he's actually the last one to get off. So the animals and uh, pairs got off, and um, he's reluctant. He's still there, he's, and his family is still there. And here's here again is a. Uh, a modern tale. There was a famous psychological experiment uh, called Bear in the Cage. Any of you were psych, if any of you were psych majors, you would you would know this. Um, it was done by Skinner at uh, uh, at uh, Columbia, and he told the story of a bear in a cage. The Bear had lived its entire life in a cage that was 15 by 20 feet. And they decided that it was time for the bear to retire. They moved the cage, they put it in an open area, and they opened the door to the cage. For a long time, the bear stared at the door, but it didn't go through. Finally, very timidly, Tiny step by tiny step, the bear stepped out. And guess what? From then until he died, he never exceeded 15 by 20 feet. He took the area of his cage, moved it outside, and that's as far as he could go. So the bear thought that his only choice was A or B, stay in, go out. But it never occurred to him that there was A, B, or C, where out doesn't have to be the same as in. And so the bear stayed in that, uh, in that tiny area. Same thing happened, um, there's, a, there's a short story by Hemingway where he, does, he describes a bullfight. Um, I read this years ago when we were going to Spain. And um, in a bullfight, apparently Hemingway, uh, Hemingway describes uh, a phenomenon called querencia. Anybody here ever hear of that? I guess we're not all, none of us are bullfight fans. Um, 
the carencia is what the bull sees as its safe zone. It's running away from this, 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 these guys with the picks and the swords. And it finds one area of the um, bull ring that it declares to be safe. And it stays, it tries to stay there. The bullfighter wants the bull to find its carencia because then it's going to calm down. Once it calms down, then he can go at it. So maybe the arc became his carencia. And maybe the um, we might be in a similar situation. Because even though it's horrible to be cooped up all the time, and we miss not doing this and not doing that, we've also gotten used to it. I mean, you're going to have to wear shoes again. You're, you're going to have to, I mean, the, right now, the, the entire clothing industry, the whole fashion industry has taken a deep dive. Uh, nobody's bought any clothes here. I've got a whole closet full of suits <laughs> and shirts that, that, that aren't getting wear, worn and never, uh, never expect to be to wear the ball again. Uh, but this is how it is, and um, we get used to a situation. It's possible that when we go out, you know, when God willing, this, this thing allows us to loosen up, um, that when we go out, uh, it's going to be a little uncomfortable at first. It's going to be a little strange. And then you can go. What do you think? I think, I, I think that's well said that, um, you know, for X amount of time, who knows how long we have learned to live within a new shell. Just like you said, we don't wear our sport coats or ties. I mean, it's a new shell. And then at some point we're released back into the world. And how soon will we embrace each other, feel comfort levels, get back to doing things, go to a theater where we're going to sit. It's going to be um, a learning experience for a lot of people and especially older folks. I'm in that group often don't adapt. Well, you tend to get very, uh, very sedentary in where you are and learn to live within it. Well, you, I just, I mean, for, for me, when the uh, thinking back a week or so ago, uh, the highlight of my week was getting a root canal. <laughs> oh God. I was actually looking forward to it. Actually, it was a big surprise. The first time I ever had a root canal, I imagine that was, you know, probably what the Spanish Inquisition did to people. Um, <laughs> when, uh, you know, this one was, was, I almost slept through the whole thing. It's amazing. That's the way you get, <coughs> Rabbi? Yeah. The last time I got pic just a little aside, the Please. last time I saw pictures of a bullfight, I found myself quietly cheering for the bull. Uh huh. That's, that's a lost cause. Yeah. The well, outcome is the outcome is known in advance. Yeah, the outcome <laughs> is known in advance, and uh, I just and unfortunately, when the, the uh, picture of the bear in a cage, the bear mm -hmm. is in a he may not be in a physical cage, but he's in a mental cage because he's been trained that way. And to be able to go into a new area, it's an unsafe zone. So what was said just a moment ago, it's trepidation. When the movies open open up again. Will it be safe or will it be another unsafe zone? We are we are right now, I think, mentally in a, in a cage with this uh, shelter in place uh, uh, philosophy. We have put it, put ourselves into a mental cage. Well, it's yeah, it's, it's probably a necessary evil, I think, is worse if you're out there running around on the beach. Um, yes. So. Um, but I, I'm, I'm afraid, I want to stay on this for a minute. Um, I'm afraid that we may not choose to go to the movies because, hey, we got Netflix now. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. Yeah. I don't have to look in the paper to see which 11 films are showing. I can see which 2,000 films are showing. <laughs> Rabbi, I would like to see how thrilled I am with your root canal experience. As a retired dentist, I am glad that you had a 
good experience. Thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> On behalf of all dentistry. Yeah, oh, thank you. Okay. okay. Secondly, um, I experience this every day. I live at the Club at the Strand, which is a, commu uh, a gated community. When I go through those gates to come home, I get this feeling of elation. Mm -hmm. the home, it's my refuge, yeah. it's my safety zone. And it, it, I look around and it's beautifully maintained. And I say how fortunate I am that I have this area that I could call home, which to me is synonymous with refuge. It's home. Mm -hmm. So I, I identify, I would have stayed on the ark for a while. Yeah. <laughs> oh. so, so Rabbi, if we're going to use this allegory that you mentioned, and we are all, Noah, in ourselves, and our refuge, as Paul said, it can be the ark. So if we, are, if we are the embodiment of Noah, and we'd like to say in our ark, when we go outside for the first time, that in, implies having a lot of trust about the outcome of our exit and about God helping us through that process. Beautiful. Thank you. <coughs> Those are the kind of conclusions that <laughs> make rabbis happy to hear. Um, I want to um, skip to slide seven, please, because it, it's um, 9.52 and we got, we're at minus eight minutes. So I want to observe the time and I uh, need time for this. Uh, Noah built an altar to the, this is what happens when things start getting put back together again. Noah built an altar to the Lord, taking some of all the clean animals, and, uh, Somebody else read, Mom, my screen's a little blocked here. Oh, I will. Okay. Uh, this is Randy. Uh, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking, let me, let me just move this, and taking all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed bird offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans. <sighs> Even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, ouch, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As mm. long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Yeah, well, the, except for every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, that doesn't make us feel good. Well, I said, ouch, yeah, yeah, it was, ouch. Yeah, but you know, we, um, I, I once worked with a principal uh, who was very, very good. And uh, we decided that uh, together that uh, we, th there was one kid we couldn't, absolutely couldn't handle. And it wasn't fair to the others. And we had to say, uh, you know, Sunday school, Hebrew school is not for you. Um, and tried to make other arrangements for him, but it didn't help. Um, <clears throat> he, had a, he had a particular problem. Um, we actually nicknamed him Joel the Torch. <laughs> 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 and we, we, couldn't have, we couldn't put up with that. Um, Rabbi? Yeah. I've got an issue with the clean animals and clean birds. How do you define, or how did Noah define a clean animal and a clean bird for one? Well, it comes and number two. It comes, I told you, there's nothing earlier, nothing later. It, it, it gets defined later. <clears throat> and this but is one, clean and this is unclean. And, but, but Rabbi, yeah. considering I'm on the ark and I've got two of everything, and I take clean animals and clean birds and sacrifice them, I've lost several species on the earth. I've only had two and I sacrifice that they can't reproduce. Well, There's either one or none. Yeah, you're right. Well, <laughs> like I say, you're right. Dirty animals and dirty birds. Yeah, so um, the, uh, the Bible has never gotten an A for logical consistency. It just <laughs> keeps going like it is. But, uh, but here's, here's the, um, you know, 
this was Lydia's first question that I deferred, I think. Um, verse 22, what you've got here are pears, okay? Uh, seed time and harvest, planting, harvesting, cold, hot, summer, winter, day, night. What it says is that the basic cycles of life uh, have not been eliminated. And what happens to Noah? This is, this is the interesting thing. He, he, builds an, he builds an altar, which is standard procedure for those days and offers a sacrifice, also standard procedure for those days. And um, later, the text goes on to say, um, the first thing he did, and the only thing he did, was he planted a vineyard. And then he got drunk. <laughs> I, I would vote yes for that. Yeah, I mean, this, <laughs> this, is, this is the culmination, this is our hero. Um, so he gets drunk, he gets into a compromised sexual situation that's not defined with, uh, with one of his own sons. And <laughs> it's, it's pretty weird. And um, that's it. So the, the Midrash was not gonna let that go. And I found this one that I really got a kick out of. Um, this is from my favorite source, Sefer HaGadah, it's called The Book of Legends. Bialik and Rabnitsky uh, compiled a long time ago, but it's nothing's better. And uh, <clears throat> here is the story they told. When Noah began planting, Satan appeared. Now, Satan was pretty common in Babylonian culture. He stationed himself next to him and said, what are you planting? And Noah said, the vineyard. And Satan said, what is its nature? And Noah said, its fruit, whether fresh or dried, is sweet. And from it, one makes wine, which gladdens our hearts. Satan, will you agree to be partners and let us both plant it together? Noah, very well. What did Satan do? He brought a lamb and he slaughtered it over a vine. And after that, he brought a lion, which he also slaughtered, and then a monkey, which he also slaughtered, and finally a pig, which he also slaughtered over the vine. And with the blood that dripped from them, he watered the vineyard. The charade was Satan's way of saying that when a man drinks one cup of wine, he acts like a lamb, humble and meek. When he drinks two, he immediately believes himself to be as strong as a lion and proceeds to brag mightily, saying, who is like me? And when he drinks three or four cups, he immediately becomes like a monkey, hopping about, giggling, uttering obscenities in public without realizing what he's doing. And finally, when he becomes blind drunk, he is like a pig, wallowing in garbage, and coming to rest among garbage. <laughs> Cute. Yeah, the, this is not an argument, argument for temperance. Uh, <laughs> Judaism has a lot of, uh, a, a lot to say about wine and it's, it's, it's all good stuff. But it's what they, what they really wanted to advocate as the, as the golden mean, as, as moderation in all things. Uh, and they brought Satan into it to do that. And then there's another one, it's, it's long, I'm not gonna read it to you, but I'll tell you about it. Um, Satan says, what are you planting? And he says, I'm planting a vineyard. What's it for? It's for making wine. And Satan says, wouldn't it be better if you planted figs or olives, which are food staples of the Middle East? And, um, and Noah answers pretty much, I brought the vine with me. He <laughs> kind of snuck it in the contraband on, on, on the ark. And he, he was ready to plant it. Not so sure he brought the figs and the olives, but there must have been some left there anyway. Uh, David raised the issue of clean uh, and unclean animals. 
so the first the raven is sent out and the raven doesn't come back. There's a negative perception of the raven because the raven is an unclean animal, but it's also nature's undertaker. It feeds on carrion, on dead animals. So there must have been plenty of those after the flood and it had yeah. enough so it didn't come back. Uh, then he sent the dove and I remember we had a pair of doves living in our house, I mean, above our house on our roof. And they used to coo every morning and Jane and I love to listen to them. Um, they, and doves are known, they're famous for, for being monogamous. Um, they have one partner for life. Um, and they, um, the doves are the only animals that fight other birds with their wings, not with their beaks. Mm -hmm. They're gentle. Mm -hmm. And so they doves became the, the universal symbol of, uh, of peace, of harmony, like that. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason for the dove. And then the dove goes out twice. First time comes back because there was no place to land. Second time, uh, the, uh, it landed and it brought back an olive branch, which it became a symbol forever and ever. Go to the very last slide, please. And we're gonna, nope, next. Yep, okay, this is an old spiritual. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, don't you see, don't you see? God gave Noah the rainbow sign, don't you see, don't you see? God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, but the fire next time. That's what that's about. You like that? I like it too. Okay, so that's the cautionary tale. No more water, but the fire next time. Exactly. And I noticed that the battery on my laptop is about to leave us, so it's a good time to drop out. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Rabbi all. Furman. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Shabbat Shalom. Um, oh, pleasure. So tune in um, to our Shabbat morning worship, which you can find live streamed or on Facebook. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, everyone.